Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Day Zero podcast. I'm Spectre. With me is Z. Today, we'll get into some news around some of the Pwn events that have uh, been happening over the last week, as well as a mixed bag of RCEs. Before we get into that, though, I will quickly shout a discussion video we'll be dropping this week on Thursday at 8 a.m. Eastern. Uh, we have a guest on it with Drugi, who uh, some of you who are in our Discord may know. He's a moderator of our Discord, which you can also check out. We have a uh, link in the YouTube descriptions as well as in Twitch. Um, but the video is about life in the security industry and the types of jobs that are available there. So, yeah, make sure to check that out when it drops on Thursday. With that said, let's talk about Pwn to Own. So, Pwn to Own WD Cloud Edition, or sorry, uh, Tokyo, took place last week. Uh, it was a three-day three event hosted live from Toronto. So you can notice with the name, it's a little bit weird. It's po uh, Pwn to Own Tokyo live from Toronto, and that's obviously because of the the crazy uh, COVID stuff. They they couldn't host the event actually in Tokyo this year. Um, as usual, when covering Pwn to Own, we'll cover some of the targets hit. Uh, we, we won't cover all of them, and then we'll cover some of the final results and, and thoughts. Uh, so on day one, uh, there were a few teams. Uh, Star Labs targeted the Netgear Nighthawk uh, R7800 routers. Uh, they managed to gain code execution on the LAN interface. Trappa Security and 84C0 targeted the Western Digital MyCloud Pro series. Um, and there was some collision on that. 84C0 got no po pwn points because it was uh, already previously reported. And uh, the Vietel cybersecurity team targeted the Q60T Samsung TV. Uh, but they used a known bug. On the second day, there was even more collision with the w the WD MyCloud Pro, which is why I, I kind of worked that into the way I introduced it. Uh, there was Team Bug Scale had collision with WD MyCloud Pro. Um, F Secure Labs also hit the Q60T as well as uh, Vietel, um, and they also used a known bug. There might have been a collision there, but they don't say that it was previously reported in Pwn to Own, so it, it might have just been a different known bug. Um, and then another researcher, Sam Thomas, also targeted uh, WD MyCloud Pro. On the third and final day, DevCore targeted the MyCloud Pro as well, using six different bugs, uh, two of which were already used in uh, Pwn to Own. So that, that resulted in five collisions on uh, WD MyCloud Pro. Uh, and then finally, Star Labs popped uh, the Synology disk, disk station NAS with uh, a race condition. So in terms of results, uh, Team Flashback won with four Master of Pwn points. DevCore came second with three and a half, and Trappa came third with three. Uh, overall, they rewarded $137,000 roughly for 23 unique bugs. Uh, there were a lot of partials this year. Uh, I think in total, the counts were eight successes, nine partials, and two failures. So the the thing with Pwn to Own, I, I thought it was kind of disappointing in, in the terms that all of these targets were IoT. They were they were kind of soft targets, in my opinion. Uh, Pwn to Own Tokyo, uh, for those who have been familiar with Pwn to Own in the past, it used to be Pwn to Own Mobile. Uh, so, you know, hitting iPhone and Android and stuff like that. Um, yet, in, in this competition, there were no phones hit, no browsers hit, no operating systems hit, nothing like that. It was all, like, TVs and routers. I mean, um, this is basically, like, was it Pwn... I want to say Pwn to Own Miami last year? Uh, was their IoT one? So yeah, it might just be that, that they're kind of right. rotating it around. Um, that, or maybe, you know, Tokyo is always going to be like this. But, I mean, it's not like Pontone hasn't done an IoT one before. You know, yeah, they're all IoT. Somewhat of an easier target. That said, I mean, the companies getting involved here are at least making an attempt at securing their IoT devices. Yeah, it, it was just um, it was a little bit disappointing in terms of targets because they do still feel like soft targets. Um, now the the other thing that I found interesting was fluoroacetate didn't compete in this event, and why that's notable is in the previous Pondone events we've covered, uh, the duo Richard, I forget the other person's name, but there's basically they, a duo. I don't believe they competed in the other IOT one, the last IOT Pondone either. Oh, okay, I know they did. Uh, participate in one we covered this year, but anyway. Yeah, but um, we covered mobile and um, like browser. Yeah, but when they participate, they absolutely dominate. Uh, they just they take first place in everything, and uh, with with their lack of participation in this event, the results were a lot closer. Um, 
So, you know, there was a little bit more competition there, at least. Um, but it, it also seems like there was a lot more collision this year than years past, um, probably because of those softer targets, um, potentially, you know, easier bugs, easier to find, more valuable to report than harder to find ones. Um, I feel like it, it might be in ZDI's interest to limit target selection down more for future events or just have like one IOT event in a year or something, because I really like had like no interest in following this event as I saw the targets coming out. Um, I don't know how you feel about that like idea of it could just be because Pwn to own Chinese teams aren't allowed to compete in Pwn to own anymore. Um, and it seems since that's been the case, it's now teams just thinking, what's the softest target I can hit with the least amount of effort to try to squeeze out like 5k or something. Um, and if Pwned Own events continue with these less interesting targets, I might just stop paying attention to them, really. Uh, maybe maybe I'll, I'll check out the results at the end, but like I used to follow Pwned Own uh, results live because I found them so interesting. And I just I just didn't really care that much, honestly, this time around. Um, I, I mean, I can to some extent I can agree, but at the same time, I think this is more an example of just Pwned to Own growing. So now they're not only, you know, browsers, not only some of the phones, like they've continued to grow and are having, you know, other industries interest in actually participating in that and, you know, allowing their devices to be attacked in this sort of competition, uh, highlighting their own vulnerabilities so they can get that information paying out on them. Um, I, I think it's just an example. They're growing. Some people have different interests than we have. Uh, there's still going to be the pwn to own where they're covering the browsers, uh, where they're covering some harder ta uh, targets. Well, that's the thing, though. This was supposed to be that event. Um, if you look at the announcement for pwn to own Tokyo, uh, they even say right in the announcement that the the big focus on it is phones, and they list the phones that are like uh, that are allowed targets, like the the Android phones and stuff like that, and also the iPhone 11, if I remember correctly. It's just that none of the teams wanted to hit that because... Which then I find kind of interesting that they're not hitting the phones. It's like, and so my, I thought this was their... I just assumed, given what was being hit, this was that IoT phone to own similar i think it was miami i might be mistaken about that i know but phone to own at, has had a um like uh iot one before so i just thought that was this if they announce this as being something other than that or having all the phones involved and teams are choosing not to that that is actually i think worth worth a bit more of a discussion i i didn't notice that i didn't look at how this one was actually announced you haven't have the link for that yeah, I do. I'll actually bring it up on screen now. So in the announcement thread, you can see uh, they have the target handset. So they have the Pixel 4, the Galaxy S20, iPhone 11, Huawei P40. Um, and then they they also have the smart tech, right? Like the wearables and the, the televisions and routers. But those were kind of the secondary targets. It seemed like they had the phones on the top. That's what they wanted people to target. It just seems like teams didn't want to put all the effort in because obviously hitting those phones is harder than hitting these little dinky IoT devices, right? Um, and that's what I think happened was just the teams didn't have any interest in hitting those handheld devices because it was just, um, I guess, more effort for what you could potentially, like, if you're just going for the master of pwn points and winning pwn to own, then it's probably more worth it to just hit the easier targets to try to rack up more points than hitting a big target. Um, but yeah, like that makes the event a little bit less interesting for me, and and feels like uh, the 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 target was kind of missed on what Pondone wanted, you know. Well, what Pondone wanted, and I think what you know, essentially the viewers of Pondone, if you want to call it that. I mean, it's I guess this time they did stream, but it's not exactly a spectator friendly sport or anything like that. <laughs> Uh, it's not like watching races. <laughs> but one of the interesting things about Pontone has been seeing, you know, those harder exploits coming out of it. Yeah. So yeah, like I agree, it's definitely disappointing to see teams weren't going for that. Uh, there could be multiple reasons behind that. Perhaps it's just teams were going for it and didn't find vulnerabilities. I find that That's somewhat unlikely. Yeah, it, it's a possibility. I do find it somewhat unlikely that that's the case given past performance like i can't imagine 
you know, now suddenly nobody's able to find anything. It could be the value of these exploits has gone off on like the gray market. Uh, I, I so... think that's a more likely factor is the fact that people don't want to burn these bugs at pwn to own and the value is increased at the same time you do have companies like f secure where they kind of make their money off of having that research coming out so pwn to owns a good place to kind of be able to do that research still get some money get the um i guess notoriety for it uh while still kind of staying on the disclosure side of things rather than selling off to the gray market so there there are incentives for companies to do that like the research teams to still do that who aren't going to be selling off or just the companies that wouldn't be selling off to the gray market so like it makes more sense if we're talking about the individual participants rather than those that do have like company backing yeah obviously we can only speculate I could also see this event being disappointing from a company standpoint, like Enterprise, because I think I've talked about it before, but companies do use Pwn to Own as a as a metric or a window to see how they're doing in terms of their, sec their security stance. So if they get popped at Pwn to Own, they know, okay, this is we need to improve on this area wherever the bug might have been found or something like that. There's definitely useful insights that companies get besides just the bug reports. Um, but obviously, where they didn't hit those phones, uh, Google and Samsung and Apple and these companies aren't going to be getting those insights because there's nothing to be had there. So I can see it being disappointed, for, uh, disappointing from their perspective as well. Uh, what I think was a much more interesting event, though, and where people had their attention focused was the Tianfu Cup, uh, which is the Chinese-based event, which is where some of those teams that used to participate in Pwn to Own uh, had to move to. So... Tianfu Cup also took place last week. It started on November 6th, and I think it was also a three-day event, if I remember. Or uh, might have been a two-day event, actually, uh, looking at the Twitter that you pulled up. Um, but some of the targets that were hit were very big targets. Uh, iOS 14 on iPhone 11 Pro, the Galaxy S20, uh, Windows 10 was even hit, uh, version 2004, which was, I think, the August update. Um, Ubuntu, Chrome, Safari, Firefox, Docker, even VMware and Q QAMU were hit, so the virtualization stuff was hit as well. Um, so a lot of interesting targets were hit. Um, the winning team from last year came around to win again, which was the uh, Kaiho 360. Uh, they, they came home with $744,000 out of the $1.2 million prize pool. So uh, the prize pool here is also a lot larger than Pwn to Own. Um, Int Financial Lightyear Security Lab came second. Uh, what a name, by the way. And a independent security researcher, it seems, uh, named Peng, uh, came in third. So this target list kind of blows Pwn to Own out of the water in terms of everyday devices that people use. Um, and many interesting targets and exploits will, will be coming out of this. Now, technical details aren't known for most of the findings. Uh, many of them probably haven't even had fixes shipped yet for them. So those will probably come in like the days and weeks. Uh, we might see some write-ups or something after they've been patched. We can only guess on that, though. Uh, people might have to go commit surfing to find the actual bugs that were fixed. Um, but there's there's definitely people with their eyes peeled here to see if their zero days got burned because of that target list. Um, you know, when you, you see those to, targets. Do you have to know if, um, like, what involvement the companies have with the Tianfu Cup? That I'm not sure on. Uh, the Tianfu Cup I know less about on the logistics side of things. Yeah, I mean, um, being in China, we, we can't really yeah. read it. Yeah, like even the results board is, is hard to read. We had to go off translations for some of the top teams. Um, yeah, I mean, ZDI, I think, is a little bit more transparent when it comes to how they how they interact with vendors. Like, I, I don't know. It's a little bit weird right now with uh, with COVID, but before COVID, the vendors were on site at CDI to, you know, talk to the researchers and get information about the issues to fix them. I don't know if that's the same situation with Tianfu Cup. I imagine the vendors still have some kind of communication channel, but I don't know if it, they have that same kind of interaction with the researchers directly. Um, that could be an interesting, like if somebody listening knows that, uh, definitely like leave a comment about that because I'd, I'd be interested to hear about that. Um, but yeah, to answer your question, like I'm, I'm not totally sure how that process works logistically. 
Um, but what I think this competition goes to show is just how much these Chinese teams are are just killing it in the bug competition space. Um, when they got banned from going to Pwn to Own, this event kind of became the new top event to look for in terms of uh, gray market for looking to see if zero days are getting burned, and probably for vendors too, with what I was saying with Pwn to Own, uh, with getting some insights into where they might want to address potential issues in the code base and stuff like that. So, yeah, Tian Fu Cup was uh, was a lot more interesting than Pwn to Own, in my opinion. And uh, I'm, I hope we'll be able to get to see some of the bugs and exploits that came out of it. Um, um, it would be said, nice to see them, but being Chinese teams, I can also imagine we'll get Chinese write-ups. Yeah, I mean, Translate will be able to help, although uh, Chinese is, is difficult to translate from automatically, so we'll, we'll yeah, see how that works I've, out. I've done some translated write-ups like that. Uh, a lot gets lost. Yeah. Yeah, it's weird. It, the language barrier between English and uh, some of the Asian languages like Japanese and Chinese are, are a lot greater than, let's say, like English and French, for example. But yeah, uh, yeah hopefully we'll still get to see some details. So we'll move into some exploits. Um, this one is an old issue that only recently got posted about due to fear of retaliation. So, you know, it's an interesting story out of the gate. It's, uh, it's a bug that allows you to get unlimited chase ultimate reward points. Um, so there's not many technical details here. This story is a bit more political or drama in a sense. Um, the researcher discovered the issue in November of 2016. And the researcher discovered that when they transferred balances between accounts for the unlimited Chase uh, Ultimate Reward points on the uh, Chase Bank site, uh, when they did that on an unstable internet connection, a double transfer would occur. So if you transferred from one account to the other, one account would end up with double the amount of the transfer, and the other account would uh, get double the amount deducted. So it would go to like a negative point count, for example, if, if the point count was low enough. And uh, we've talked about some similar types of issues in the past, uh, usually induced by race conditions. Um, yeah, this one is a little bit interesting on that part, though, because they do say it's when they have an unstable internet connection. So, like, often with race conditions, you're sending multiple requests kind of rapid fire. Uh, but if you're having an unstable connection, more likely things are being dropped. Uh, so the only yeah. thing I think of is, like, your retransmission, but that's, you know, done TCP level like no servers should be seeing that as like two actual separate requests. So unless something else was causing it, like, okay, request failed, therefore try it again. Um, which doesn't seem to be the likely case here. So I do find it interesting. That's the unstable connection that resulted in this. Yeah. It's, it's similar in, uh, the end result to what we've seen with race conditions in the past. But like you said, it's it's the unstable internet connection is weird. I wish we got a little bit more technical details on that aspect. Um, but yeah, like I said, it mostly goes into the, more of the political side of it. So since w this was tied to a bank, uh, Chase, they didn't want to tread any dangerous ground. So initially in 2016, uh, they tried to report the issue through Twitter uh, because at the time uh, Chase didn't have a bounty program. Uh, they responded and gave him permission to test. And uh, when he did the POC, it actually worked so well that he essentially managed to create 5 million reward points, which was equivalent to 70,000 US dollars. So this is an insanely impactful issue from a financial standpoint. Um, and then the, the researcher took it further to test that these points could actually be withdrawn, uh, which was possible. So after they wrote that POC and confirmed the points could actually be used, uh, and financially damaging. They sent all that information over to Chase, and uh, Chase initially stated that they'd fixed the issue, and it seemed to be going well in terms of the interaction. Um, then a week later, they got an email saying they can't disclose uh, the information. Uh, he said he can't disclose it because it was so hostile, but yeah, apparently he got a hostile message like a week later. And years later, uh, they sent an email stating they were closing all of their investment and banking accounts associated with them, including five credit cards he had with them for years. So, <laughs> um, yeah, it so like they I, took it in stride. I'm sorry, I want to jump back a little bit. Uh, when it came to kind of the process here and the disclosure process, he did uh, get permission before he tried to actually claim those points. Yeah, um, like he did go back. He had first the permission to do like some testing, but then they also want to make clear that um, 
like before he actually tried to use those illegitimately gained points he did also kind of get further permission from chase to do that or at least he believes he did um some of that does come out from the reddit thread where the author was talking about this i just want to kind of point out that on the disclosure side like he did take i'd argue a lot of the right steps uh towards doing this disclosure especially since they didn't have a disclosure program in place yeah um, i think so as well his accounts now uh have been deleted as you're saying it's unclear if it's related to this or not. He seems pretty certain that it is related to this, although, you know, it's been four years and they'd only now just be taking kind of a punishment against it. It does seem a little bit, a little bit on the strange side, but he hasn't provided any other reason and I can't expect Chase to uh, provide any reason. Yeah, I mean, it... It's worth noting that this should be taken with a bit of a grain of salt, because this is only one side of a two-sided story, obviously. Yeah. Um, and like you were saying, like happening years later does seem weird. At the same time, banks usually don't just terminate your accounts out of nowhere. Um, and if there's nothing else that he did that would warrant that termination, it seems likely that it would be connected to that initial report, especially if they did react hostily towards it initially. Um, Obviously, we don't know all the details, but banks are kind of known for being vindictive when it comes to breaking their stuff. Um, now, I will say, for something this financially damaging, I think it might have been in the best interest of the researcher to ask for a more legally binding permission to test this. Um, something, Maybe something with a signature instead of just a Twitter DM. Um, I, I don't know how you think about that, because like a Twitter DM from their account is technically written permission. I just feel like if it ever went to like a court or something, it could easily be challenged. Like, oh, our Twitter account was hacked or something stupid like that. Whereas However, with a signature, it's a lot harder to claim something like that. If if their Twitter account were hacked, it would still be the case that he was operating under the belief that he had permission to do so. Um, and that that intent not to commit a crime, like even though it's false, like that does matter. Um, okay. because he's taken some steps of due diligence towards ensuring that he was acting appropriately. Now, uh, again, I always have to preface this stuff by indicating, like, I'm not a lawyer, but in my understanding, like, that intent does matter, because we kind of had this come up when we were talking about those two pen testers who got arrested, uh, yeah. the physical assessment against one of the state, uh, state buildings. Like, they believe that they had permission to be doing their assessments, so they weren't charged with um, they weren't charged with anything actually related to that. It was some, it, it was downgraded to something. I can't remember what the crime they actually got. I, I think initially with. they were going to charge him with B and E, but then they downgraded it to trespassing or something. Uh, maybe the maybe trespassing. Yeah, we'd have to go look back at the actual report on it, but it, it got downgraded largely because, like, they were operating with the belief that they were forming legal work which does change kind of how the blame comes. Obviously, the person giving permission who shouldn't have uh, kind of gets some of the blame in that case. It doesn't just fall on the pen tester who had r reason to believe that they were operating legally. Um, in this case, it is worth also noting, like, this guy isn't a pen tester. He's a developer. Uh, so not really coming at from that same perspective. I think it's fair, like, if you can, like, get more permission than just a Twitter DM. Though, at the same time, I'd argue it's at least sufficient for some things. Like, if this were, say, like, a SQL injection that was going to dump data, uh, obviously, you, you probably want more, especially when it comes to banking information. You're probably going to want a lot more information or a lot more uh, solid of a permission structure in place. Something like this, where basically just generating points out of thin air. Again, it's hitting the bank financially, but it's not hitting other people's data or anything or their accounts. Yeah, and it's something that should be easily rectified on their side, like by removing it. It's not an actual breach of data. Yeah, I don't know. I've I think it's definitely a fair question to ask, and I don't know where I would draw the line. 
I don't feel like this guy operated poorly, though. Like, I don't think he absolutely, like, should have gone further on it. I think going further would be a good idea uh, in terms of that permission, but I don't think, like, what he did was wrong. Yeah, exactly. I, I don't think this excuses the apparent behavior of Chase here. Um, obviously, I, I will close out here by saying, though, we, we don't know all the details. Obviously, we only have the, the blog post and the author's comments on Reddit that Z dug up uh, to be able to comment on. So there could be more to the story that we just don't know about. And uh, it actually seems like that is kind of likely because there are some weird aspects of the story like that many years later um, termination of the accounts. So, yeah, yeah, the termination seems like there's definitely more to this that we're just not hearing. Uh, that said, we're not going to hear from Chase. Like, I wouldn't expect a company like Chase to uh, issue a statement regarding somebody's personal account and why it was closed. Yeah, no, no, no chance. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, we can move on from that. So we have a GitHub issue reported by Google Project Zero. So this is via GitHub Actions. Uh, for, for those of you who don't know, uh, GitHub Actions facilitates continuous integration. Uh, and how that is done is via workflows and commands that are inside of them. So how GitHub processes those workflow files is um, they're, they're actually processed by parsing std out of the executed actions to look for command markers. So in v2, that's the double colon, in v1, uh, double hashtag. And one of the commands that they support inside of workflows is the ability to set environment variables, which seems somewhat reasonable because environment variables are used in build scripts and stuff pretty frequently. Um, but as the report author points out, there is a, sus a susceptibility for injection here if an attacker can influence STD out at all, um, because they can then just inject commands into it that would get par parsed. So if any untrusted data can get into STD out, one can set the environment variables, for example, to achieve remote code execution, um, usually as soon as another workflow is executed. So one example they give is the VS Code repository. So they have a workflow for newly opened issues, and the purpose of that workflow is to copy issues into other repositories. And the issue title is printed into the STD out stream, which can then be used for command injection. So you can use the uh, you can open an issue on the repository, create a title that would uh, overwrite environment variables via that command that I talked about earlier. And one example they give is overwriting the node options environment variable. Uh, which allows them to set an experimental loader that'll execute a potentially malicious payload. So the biggest issue with this vulnerability is it's not just a bug or like a technical oversight. It's an inherent design flaw with how they parse commands out of STD out and inherently seem to trust uh, the output of that stream for yeah. whatever reason. Yeah, it's a, bit, it's a design choice for sure that they've decided like they wanted to support adding environments and to be fair this isn't like arbitrary command injection uh, there are specific commands that are supported here such as spec was saying set environment or set env uh, the other one that's used that could be used for some easy exploits is add path which of course adds oh, that's a good one adds yeah. something to the path of um that's going to be looking up so you've got those two as the main ones pointed out um it is also worth mentioning, and this matters, I believe, for the VS Code one, is that you can only do kind of one injection at a time in the VS Code case. Uh, that's because some of these cases will... Or sorry, uh, in version... In version one, you can kind of have commands in line, I believe. Yes. Uh, so version one commands were kind of in line. You just do the double hashtag and then all the command information. Version two... Uh, you do the double colon, but it has the double colon has to be at the start of the line. And actually, I guess I'm mistaken for the VS Code. It looks like you could possibly do multiple since they're us using version one. Uh, but I believe they do call out in one case where they weren't able to get an exploit as easily because of that uh, requirement that uh, it be at the start of a line. Yeah. So because of the fact that it's an inherent design flaw, the author even stated, I'm not really sure of the best way to address this issue. Uh, they stated a good long-term fix would be to move workflow commands to some out-of-bound channel to avoid parsing STD out, so opening like a different file descriptor. 
Um, but they they know that would break existing code. So it's it's not really the best solution either. Um, and because this issue is, is so difficult, you can see in the timeline, this issue still exists. Uh, it, it hasn't been addressed. Um, they reported the issue to GitHub on July 21st. Uh, on October 1st, GitHub issued an advisory deprecating the vulnerable commands. Um, assuming, assumedly, the command has set environment variables. Uh, they, they weren't really totally clear there. Um, and then GitHub re requested an additional 14-day grace period on October 16th on top of the 90-day one that was already issued. Um, and then on November 1st, they said they won't be disabling the commands by the time of disclosure. They wanted another 48 hours to notify customers and determine a hard date for disabling the commands mentioned. Um, but Project Zero basically stated they already granted one extension. They're not going to grant another one. So disclosure would still happen on the second. And so it did. Yeah, which I think is fair. Like they say, they did already offer an extension. They had their grace period. They had 90 days beforehand to do that. It does sound like there's a communication issue where they didn't get any response. I don't think Project Zero is the type of team that usually just gets ignored. And yeah, I it's doubt like it was intentional. Gap. Yeah, it's um, weird. So, I mean, it, I'd say, you know, there's a chance that, like, you know, somebody just kind of left and was no longer monitoring the email or something. Um, obviously, I have no idea what would have happened there. Just I doubt they were intentionally being ignored on that. So it kind of sucks for GitHub, but yeah, they, they had their time to kind of deal with it. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't think Project Zero has ever granted more than one extension. I think we've covered uh, some issues before where people were unhappy with Project Zero for not extending, but I, I don't think they want to set that precedent that they can be pushed around to extend deadlines more than once. Yeah, uh, we which talked I think about, is kind of fair. We talked about the changes to their disclosure policy, I think, at the beginning of this year. They had made some changes where, like, the 90 days just became the default. They weren't going to release them early, and it was going to be a lot harder in terms of the extensions. So this is just evidence that they're basically keeping exactly what they stated. And, I mean, I have no, I had no reason to think they wouldn't. Yeah, sticking to their guns. Um, this is a potentially mass sweeping issue that could be abused, which is why, even though we're just talking about how Google is sticking to what they've said, I feel like this is one case where extending the disclosure deadline might have made more sense, just because it can affect so many projects. It's not an issue that just affects one vendor, it can affect like any vendor that uses github actions on their public repositories so yeah, so it impacts like it impacts a lot of projects but it's one platform that's impacted like github could in theory centrally fix this um it would just piss off a lot of people how to fix it is kind of a different question um you kind of mentioned uh that they've now deprecated it or and will be disabled in the near future i think another thing would be whitelisting uh, early on, setting a whitelist of environment variables that can be set might be another option uh, that yeah, you would add into the idea. beginning. That would be something that you can kind of roll out in the sense of it won't break old code. If it has no whitelist, maybe defaults open for a while and then eventually just doesn't work until you set your whitelist. That might not work for everybody if you need like wild cards, but I do think some sort of listing in there would be a better way at least to deal with the environment variables. I'm not sure about dealing with add path. Um, but I do, I feel like there are ways that they could have gone about this without just deprecating it, but it is a difficult thing to solve because like, obviously they intended these commands to be used and to have value. Um, the only other thing I think of is maybe including some sort of token with it to kind of indicate its integrity it's just you can't really hard code that but it needs to be something the all the process can can know maybe like some sort of signed signed value i i don't know i'm just kind of tossing out a few ideas on that it's definitely an interesting problem though because it is a feature that is useful and removing it does seem a little bit extreme yeah yeah, it's it's an almost impossible to solve issue without just disabling it outright. Um, but that being said, like like I said, I do think extending the disclosure deadline might have made sense. At the same time, that two month gap or so in the timeline seems like a lot of time that 
was potentially wasted on GitHub side. Uh, like they were really late on deprecating those issues. Like they deprecated them in October and it was, you know, reported in July. So there is, there is a gap there that probably should have been filled quicker that way the deprecation had a longer time window before they could disable them and they could have potentially disabled it before this report even went public so seems like a bit of a miss there yeah for sure i mean that that's absolutely on github i don't know what the communication issue was uh but that is definitely on github and they should have been a bit more on top of that but we also don't know what caused that so it's hard to really really come down and try and blame them uh, GitHub doesn't seem like the type of company that's just regularly going to exclude or have issues. Although now that I'm thinking about it, one of our last episodes, didn't we have another issue where GitHub was kind of slow to respond? On like I can't remember because we've, we've covered quite a few GitHub issues lately. <laughs> yeah, ju just lately because we were mostly covering GitLab for a while. Yeah, last last like three or four episodes, we've probably covered like maybe like four GitHub issues. <laughs> it's been pretty crazy. Uh, I don't know why there's such a sudden focus on them, but uh, yeah, there is. Oh, I like there's definitely been some, some interesting vulnerabilities coming out of that. Yeah. Although I um, just quickly looked and I'm not seeing any case where GitHub wasn't fairly responsive, just quickly looking at my notes. So I might be thinking of somebody else with that. Yeah. Yeah. Nothing comes to mind for me either. That said, We'll move on to Apple. So Apple put out a security uh, notice about iOS 14.2 and iPadOS 14.2. Uh, this was a basically a batch of security fixes. There were you can see like they have a bullet point style of all the issues that were addressed. Uh, a few audio issues um, and font parsing issues that were addressed. Some kernel uh, memory corruptions. What was notable about this advisory though? was, um, let me just find exactly where it was. Project Zero found a few of these issues. I think they found a font parsing issue and a kernel issue, and they discovered that those were being exploited in the wild. Um, they even say in the, the impact there, Apple is aware of reports that an exploit for this issue exists in the wild. And it, it looks like it's a full chain, which usually when you look at full chain for something as big of a target as iOS, it's probably nation state. So um, yeah, might might be a good idea to update your iPhones because uh, it's not every day you see the in the wild uh, issues exploited, especially in Apple's case. Uh, usually the, those exploits are very valuable because Apple is so locked down when it comes to sandboxing and stuff. So the fact that there's an unsand or a, a sandbox reachable issue that can then be escalated to kernel. Uh, yeah, you probably want to update. <laughs> so. Yeah, I think it's also worth mentioning here that with those uh, Shane Huntley, so I believe they are the, um, yeah, they're the director of the threat analysis group at Google, um, did mention that these three, uh, they or they also had that same, they're not related to any election targeting. Um, in the Another reporting one. by ZDNet, they specifically say that uh, Shane Huntley mentioned that these are related to the recent set of uh, three exploit or recent uh, Chrome zero days that we covered last time. Uh, that said, they linked to this tweet and this tweet does not say that. So there might be another source for that or it might just be misunderstanding what's being said here and that it's similar to other recently reported O days. Uh, which I do think is a kind of an interesting aspect, especially if it is related to those Chrome O days like being explained the same campaign. What would be weird though, is when you're talking about iPhone, Chrome is Chrome is more of an Android thing, right? Chrome is yeah, the default well, on Android. On and iPhone, on it's iPhone, WebCat. Yeah, exactly. And even the Chrome application on iOS uses WebKit in the back end, I think. It doesn't use uh, like Chrome's typical back end with V8 and whatnot. At least that, that was what I remember hearing a, a little while back. I don't know if that's changed or not, but... Um, those factors does make it seem unlikely that it would be chained with the Chrome one. Um, it could well, be possible they chained. just saw the two and connected them. Not necessarily uh, chained. Heads. So being part of the same campaign doesn't mean they're being chained together. Oh, just enough. that their targets that they're hitting, like it's the same group using these kind of at the same time. Like if somebody has a Android device, they're tossing out the Chrome one. If somebody's using iPhone, they're tossing out the iOS device. 
Um, that's all I mean by the relationship in the campaign being there or possibly being there. Not so much that you would chain three chromo days with that, because as you're saying, that's not really going to work out uh, just because iOS, basically, it's all WebKit. Um, out of chat, uh, there is Akiras who says, unless you want to root your iPhone, then don't update. I will say you might also not want anybody else to root your iPhone for you. Well, the cool thing about some jailbreaks, though, is they will use those bugs and entry points, and then post jailbreak, they'll actually like monkey patch them out, which is really cool. So you could potentially use this issue and, and still be safe from the underlying bugs, but uh, that's neither here nor there. Well, I mean, it is kind of a interesting discussion. I mean, when you have your phone rooted, you are opening yourself up to extra risk. Um, you might want to root it. Like, there's absolutely valid reasons to do that and use a rooted phone. So, by all means, like, you know, you're welcome to. Um, it just, if you want to be more scary, I think part of the argument would have to come down to keeping things updated rather than rooting. Although there is probably an argument to be had on the other side there that you can definitely do some more. Uh, you can implement some of your own security if you were to root your device. Most users probably aren't doing that. No. Um, most people are actually disabling a lot of the stuff that the Apple ecosystem protects you against. Um, you know, the ability to install like jailbreak, jailbreak apps and stuff like that is definitely another security uh, implication in, in using jailbreaks so that could be an interesting discussion we might do like separately uh, i don't know if i, I don't want to get into it here because i i want to have like more data points to be able to reference but uh, i i could see that being an interesting discussion that we might uh might be able to go into in the future yeah um basically here though especially if you don't care about jailbreaking yeah prob probably update good idea um but we don't have any technical details, so we'll move on to something we do have technical details on, which is a remote code execution in Rocket Chat. So Rocket Chat uh, desktop is a desktop app, um, and it allows you to set custom scripts for logged in users that are sent to the client from the server side, which seems like it could be a nice capability to provide. Um, you know, if someone wants to run scripts to do like auto deletion of messages after a period of time or something, they could use those scripts to do that. It's also a dangerous capability to provide because a rogue server can use that to run JavaScript on a victim machine. So actually, can you do that to like delete messages? It seems like this is only really intended to be more of a display thing. If you notice, this is under the layout and custom scripts area. Uh, it seems unintended that you're able to turn on node integration, for example, and set this up as a preload script. Uh, since the fix for that effectively disables that by... Um, only using the features argument, basically, if you're on a Jitsi domain. Oh, okay, yeah. I skipped over the fact that it was in the, the layout section, so, okay, fair enough. So, yeah, yeah that makes I don't sense. think that's intended. Yeah. So, like you said, um, you, you shouldn't be able to set node integration, but uh, the problem is you can. So, because of that, you can run JavaScript on a victim machine, and you can use Node.js features. Uh, we've talked about... Uh, where this could be used for RC in the past with like Discord and stuff like that. Um, I, I don't really know why they allow you to set the window options. That that seems like an odd capability to expose, especially since, like you were saying, it seems to be mostly for display stuff. Um, so yeah, it seems odd to expose that capability to uh, set that from server side in the first place, because the entire point of those window options, uh, like node integration, is to prevent this exact kind of issue. Um, but like you said earlier, it was fixed, though. It was reported July 27th, and it was fixed sometime before October 8th. We don't know exactly when it was fixed, because they just, uh, they were notified it was fixed October 8th, but it was, it was probably fixed before then. Um, and then it was finally disclosed November 7th. So, pretty straightforward issue. It's mostly just, a. Uh, it seems to be something that was missed in the implementation. Uh, you know, quick technical oversight which allowed attacks that we've talked about a lot in the, uh, yeah, in the show since, before. I mean, the fix basically ended up being that one line being added that just emptied out the features unless you're going down the uh, more trusted path, basically. Yeah. So, Git LFS, more Git issues. 
Uh, so Git large file storage also had an RCE published last week. Uh, so Git LFS is an extension for versioning large files. So it'll take uh, large files that would typically bloat a repository, so like videos or binaries or whatever, uh, and it replaces them with text pointers inside of Git while storing the file content on a remote server. So it, it's potentially a very useful extension. The problem is they don't supply a full path to the Git binary when executing a new Git process. So again, it's a classic hijack due to an incomplete path. We've covered many such issues on the show before. So by placing a malicious Git executable in the main repos directory, you can get that executable directed on a uh, executed on a victim machine instead of the real Git executable. Um, so, like the title suggests, this is technically an RCE. That being said, you would need the ability to push the malicious file into the main repo. So the impact isn't as high as you might immediately think if you just read the title. Um, but yeah, still though, still is an RCE. Could you not exploit this say with somebody cloning? Um, and then working on the repo, perhaps. Like a fork? Well, yeah, a fork would be another option too, but if somebody just cloned your repo and then... Uh, it, like, did local work on it. Uh, it didn't necessarily push it. Well, yeah, I'm just trying to think about what the uh, attack vectors would be. Yeah. That's the thing, like, while it is remote, it's one of those cases where the circumstances make it so this is almost like a self-attack unless you have control over that repository. So, yeah, it, it's not as serious, but it is, it's still a, still an issue, and the issue was patched in version uh, 2.12.1. Uh, interestingly, there was some collision on this issue as well. Uh, Blaze Infosec also found the same issue and did a write-up on it. Apparently, they were the first to report it to GitHub through Hacker One, but they weren't the first to find the issue. Um, but anyway, there is that separate write-up for anyone that's interested. I do think this write-up might be a little bit cleaner and easier to follow than the uh, the pure text one that's provided by legal hackers. Um, I must say, the, the second one, a uh, banger of a name as a Star Wars fan, it's called Attack of the Clones, uh, Git Client's Remote Code Execution. Uh, as a Star Wars fan, I, I really do appreciate that title. Um, but yeah, so Blaze Infosec collected the bounty from GitHub's Hacker One program, um, and then uh, legal hackers ended up getting the the CVE. So, and I will just kind of mention, uh, coming back on legal hackers, that feels like such a bad name. Like, if you have to point out the fact that you're a legal hacker, it just feels like a weird name. Like, I mean, it's fishy. completely unrelated. It just, yeah, it seems like that fishy name. Of being, you know, legal hackers. And it also seems like the type of thing that you would get um, on, like, YouTube comment spam or something. <laughs> like, you know, uh, you know, thank you, some name. I found a great hacker at legalhackers.com. Um, I, I mean, it, it's completely unrelated to the issue. Legitimate issue. I'm not trying to throw any shade there. I just find the name a little bit humorous. Yeah, branding could have been done a little bit better there. So yeah. we'll move on to uh, your LS. So this was a uh, an issue that was multiple stored cross-site scripting vulnerabilities in the admin panel for uh, your LS. Um, essentially, it seems they provide a hooking functionality that allows you to replace code with code you control. Uh, they call it like a filter. So uh, if I just scroll down here to the code, uh, your LS add filter, shunt is valid user, and then you can replace that with an exploit payload. Um, and the researcher states you can use that to perform stored XSS. This issue is, um, I mean, okay, so you need to be able to have administrative access to be able to edit PHP code to be able to exploit this issue. I, I'm i trying to see where this would actually be useful to attack somebody with. Yeah, I, so I suppose the scenario here is a rogue admin. That's but, basically the only case. I mean, you're not getting, like, usually with cross-site scripting, you're going to want, like, kind of a privilege escalation of sorts. You find a page that you can get access on that somebody with more privileges can access or be infected by that cross-site scripting. In this case, it's an admin user, so you already have all the permissions. You have permissions to add code. Oh, uh, So... I guess, to be fair, I will mention here that the 
Uh, part of the cross-site scripting does come because of the comments at the top here. This plugin name, plugin URL, description, version, author. Uh, all of those are where the cross-site scripting actually comes in. Uh, those get parsed and then displayed uh, when you list all of your plugins. So it has to be an admin installing a malicious plugin. So you could write a plugin that would seem legitimate that also did the cross-site scripting. It would it would potentially be other people installing it. So like there is that avenue of attack. Like I don't think the plugin name should be vulnerable here at all. Uh, but they're just showing like it's possible for the plugins to be abused. But this cross-site scripting does come out of like the name and stuff. It's not like the payload here is just you can cause code to run. Uh, so this is if you want to backdoor uh, with uh, have a backdoor plugin, which is kind of a given if you're going to have a plugin at all, like they can be backdoored. Yeah, you don't want to be installing untrusted plugins. <laughs> Typically not a good idea. I mean, you people generally do, but yeah, you generally don't want to, but most people aren't going to do a code audit of every plugin they plan to use, unfortunately. So I mean, I'm not saying that this isn't an issue. Uh, I, I think it is an issue. I do take a little bit. I looked at the CVE because I was curious because they have the uh, severity on their report listed as I, I think they have it as severe, right? Is it uh, I'm trying to find where they have that? But anyway, in the CVE, um, the CVSS score has the privileges required as low. I, I don't fully agree with that assessment. You do need admin capability, and that is pretty much like the maximum level of privileges you can have. Uh, like you were saying, this is more of a backdoor attack. It's not a privilege escalation. So well, the, the thing privileges is, required um, is a little bit of a weird rating for me that they well, put up to medium or whatever. You generally don't. Inst Most people aren't writing their own plugins. This is going to be like a plugin written by a remote attacker who you then install it from. So while the attack is needing the admin to actually do the installation, the plugin, like in most cases, people aren't the author of their own plugin. They're probably not writing it and intending uh, to have it backdoor their application. So that's where I'd kind of, I'd kind of draw the line there as being like, okay, I could understand where you're saying it's a unauthenticated attacker because the code's, probably being written by somebody completely removed from the actual process, like from the administrative privileges. Yeah, I can kind of see that. Although at the same time, if that's happening, they can run PHP code, which is already more of an issue than what this attack is. Right? Oh yeah, for so. sure. Like this is a case of like just installing malicious code. Yeah. Um. So like I, it's just a case of trusting what you're running or not trusting what you're running. Yeah, but this is this another issue where, yes, it's an issue and it should be fixed. And it, it seems like it was fixed since they limit a max version for the uh, for what the bug can hit. But um, pretty, pretty low impact, at, at least in my opinion. So. So we'll get into a fun story. Uh, this was a, a fun story from a British software engineer that decided to start a company and filed the name as a XSS vector. Uh, they had, quote, um, end tag, start tag, script source equals mjt.xss.ht, closing bracket, and then another quote. Uh, so basically making his company name an XSS vector. And this is further than I think I've ever seen anyone go when it comes to trying to exploit an, an XSS uh, though they do mention there were some previous attempts that just never really got public attention. Uh, there was apparently an SQL injection one as well that was based on that XKCD meme of, uh, I think it was like Timmy drop tables for, for his school Bobby or whatever. Tables. Bobby tables, yeah. that's what it was. Um, there has been, I mean, the SQL injection ones I always find a little bit um, less, well, they are significantly less likely to work just because you need to know like the proper table name to actually try and drop. You need to have a scenario where it's uh, splitting on the semicolons and can run stacked query or can run stacked queries, which is just not terribly likely uh, for many cases. Whereas the cross site scripting obviously it did work and can work. Seems more practical. Yeah. 
Yeah, well, you need to know a lot less. You just need to hope uh, it's being injected. Like if you get if you get that uh, double quote in there, it's basically going to work. If you don't, it's not going to work. Like there could be more complicated s scenarios, but for the most part, it's a lot easier to get a hit. Yeah. So, like you said, this can and did work, and it actually caused so many issues that they forced him to change the company name. Uh, the company name had to change to uh, that company whose name used to contain HTML scripts tags LTD. <laughs> so, um, yeah, they said a company was registered using characters that could have presented a security risk to a small number of customers. So uh, that's that's why they made him change the name. So kind of a, a funny story. Um, just an, uh, it's another one of those cases where it's something you probably don't really think of. You don't really think of a company name being a potentially malicious attack vector, but as this person showed, it it is one. And uh, while it is pretty far to go to exploit an issue, it is a potential route to go. So, yeah, I guess he just wanted to do it as kind of a uh, drawing drawing a red flag to that and saying uh, companies should be considering this in their in their threat model. I guess. Yeah, I mean, it's a route to go. It is also, even with cross-site scripting, what could they have done on this page? Um, you know, installing malware is both the only route that you'd get to go. I'm not sure there's necessarily like an admin area or something that they'd have been able to use. Uh, like there is definitely a bit of a limited risk there. Although, um, using, using this to install malware, you know, would be completely fair. Like it is an issue still. It it could be hard to do though, because I I could see there being limits on the payload, right? Um, I I don't know all the restrictions on company name filings, especially in, in well, Britain. But the thing is, like in this case, they just do a remote source, so they can put any code they want in that uh, mjt.xs.ht. Yeah, like, yeah all your fair, code yeah. goes there. This is the complete cross-site script you need for arbitrary injection. Yeah, so malware drive-by is a is still a, a very real type of attack that could be done using this. So yeah, yeah to be fair, fair that's some that could have been done with the last one too. Yeah. Continuing on our XSS train, we have a Facebook DOM-based XSS uh, using post message. So I'll let you take this one over, Z, because uh, we we do love Facebook here, but uh, I. This this issue was a little bit confusing to me, so I think you might be able to uh, help clarify some of the some yeah, of the weirdness so of this post. This one definitely kind of got a little bit of a roundabout way. Uh, the first issue that they found, so there were two bugs that got chained to get cross-site scripting. Uh, the first bug just allowed an attacker to send a post message uh, from the face, well, from uh, our dot. In their case, they use our dot alpha dot facebook dot com but essentially from a facebook.com domain um, or subdomain. I think they originally found the issue such that it was targeting our.intern.facebook.com. Uh, but anyway, they had this payments redirect page, uh, like facebook.com payments redirect.php. Um, what they found was if you change the type parameter just from I to RP, they might have been brute force. They don't actually say how they found that. Uh, but it would create a post message to send a message to the window dot opener. So post message, if you're not familiar, it's just a way of sending or kind of like raising events from one domain to another origin. Uh, so that's where post message can be used to kind of transfer information back and forth from, say, uh, you open an iframe to PayPal or something. They could be like, OK, the request is done and kind of pass you some information uh, through the window opener, uh, through this post message. So they have the ability to send post messages kind of with some Facebook endpoints. So the question was to find somewhere that they could send a post message that would be trusted. So the fact that they were on Facebook meant there's probably some places within the Facebook application that actually expect a post message to come and validate that it comes from facebook.com. Uh, which is what they went on to look for. They went to look for some part of the application that actually opens up an iframe and listens for some sort of event to come back via the post message um, and does something sensitive with it. And usually if they're going to check if 
make sure it's coming from facebook.com, there's a good chance it's doing something sensitive. What they found was the Facebook Canvas apps, which served on apps off Facebook.com. Uh, those would actually generate uh, part of the page would be generated based on this app tab URL parameter that was sent from the post message. And that app tab just didn't check if the tab that it was supposed to have was like HTTP or HTTPS. Didn't check the schema so you can do a JavaScript URL. Um, because it's coming from Facebook, it kind of just trusted whatever it gave. Um, so that lack of HTTP or HTTPS checking allow them just specify JavaScript and, you know, alert or whatever JavaScript you want to be used as that app tab URL that it would open. Uh, leading, of course, to cross-site scripting. So I think out of all the cross-site scripting issues we've covered lately, this one was probably the most difficult for me to wrap my head around. Um, probably because I'm, I'm not really familiar with that post message uh, API that you were talking about earlier. Um, but yeah, I mean, this is an issue that's hitting Facebook. And Facebook uh, was quick to turn around on this. Uh, I think they uncovered this issue on October 10th, and it was fixed October 28th, and they paid a $20,000 bounty. So um, Facebook's been known to pay decently well for, for issues. So if you're looking for somewhere to look, Facebook might be might be an idea. Um, but yeah, this issue was, was tough for me to, to wrap my head around. So thank you for explaining it there, because... Uh, you, you cleared up some of the, the points that I was confused on as well. Yeah, it's definitely, it's a little bit roundabout because it does have that extra layer of, uh, of the attack where they have the two bugs being chained, the one bug giving you the post message and then finding somewhere that trusts that post message, uh, which definitely adds to complexity. We have covered a, I, I don't know if it was exactly the same as this, but we have covered another attack that abused the post message um, that was a Google wide, like it did this domain check, um, to make sure it was only, uh, sorry, I was just looking it up here. So this is on episode 33, the unexpected Google wide domain check bypass where Google had, um, it would generate API keys. Like when you're using the API documentations, you can click a button, it'll open an iframe and it would communicate an API key back over the. Uh, post message so they were able to bypass uh, one of the checks there so it's just another issue kind of taking advantage of the post message because there is kind of that trust that if you're able to violate that trust there usually are further issues uh, so just wanted to call that one out so that, the one in episode 33 was also a little bit uh, complicated to get through but definitely kind of worth uh, giving you to read your your memory is way too good. I'm jealous. I I totally forgot about that issue. So that's that's uh good on you that you were able to remember that. Um, it's, it's so artificial memory. I have it written down here. <laughs> oh, okay, fair enough. Um, so getting into our last SQL injection uh, and XSS of the episode, we have a reflected XSS and SQL injection in the Oracle Communications Diameter Signaling Router, uh, CDSR. So the reflected XSS uh, seems to be present in the grid filter column parameter for one of the um, pages and the grid filter value parameter for range-based address resolution. So this can be reached from anyone on the network, which is notable. It doesn't require uh, authentication or anything like that. And that can allow an attacker to, to uh, hijack a session in order to exploit the more impactful bug, which is the SQL injection. Uh, this was in the admin panel endpoint for listing systems connected through the simple network management protocol. Um, and it was a, a Boolean based blind SQLI through the scope parameter. So in terms of timeline, uh, it was reported February 14th and then all the way through the year to October 20th, the critical patch update was issued. So this is the longest turnaround time we've had in the episode and maybe in the last couple episodes. Uh, that that's that's quite a while to to fix the issue, but uh, it it did eventually get fixed. Um, but yeah, it seems like they were decently straightforward issues. Uh, unlike the last one, there was no like super roundabout way to reach these ones. It was just straight up parameters that were exposed um, in the URL that were passed, and they just didn't sanitize them. So yeah, I mean the blind ones are always a little bit tricky to find an exploit. Uh, just because while well, it's blind, you don't have anything too obvious that you're actually getting a successful hit. 
Um, in some cases, like in this case, it looks like it was pretty straightforward. Uh, single quote and single bracket uh, escape them into their arbitrary query. So I think you could figure it out from there. Uh, yeah. But sometimes it can be kind of tricky. Um, in this case, it doesn't look like it was that bad. But worth pointing out, like, you know, it's a, it's a good find, especially if this wasn't a white box assessment. Yeah. Now, I will say uh, NCC Group, we, we've covered them a lot, and they always give really detailed timelines. It is pretty interesting if you go to the timeline, you can see all the way through the year until they patched the issue, there was a lot of automatic status updates under investigation uh, and then issue addressed in the main code line. <laughs> like, it's funny how much detail they provide here when really it's just Oracle saying, uh, don't worry, we know, we're, we're fixing it. <laughs> a lot of uh redundant details in the timeline but you know fair enough uh ncc group has always been more verbose when it comes to uh, reporting the timeline which is which definitely isn't a bad thing uh just gave me a bit of a chuckle when i was looking at it but yeah issue itself fairly straightforward um not too much to talk about there our next post is rediscovering a jwt authentication bypass and service stack so this is a PSA type post from a pen testing company called Shielder. And it talks about how they ended up discovering a previously reported uh, or fixed JWT authentication bypass in uh, service stack on an assessment. So unlike most of the exploits that we cover, this one was already patched. Um, essentially, they tried to bypass a third party OAuth service the web app was using, which utilized JWT tokens. And they discovered when you remove the signature from the token, they got a 200 OK response back instead of a, an error response, um, which is really strange and basically tipped them off that there was a big problem here. Um, yeah, I mean, it's actually, I, I won't say it's that strange, actually, this one. It's basically your null signature issue. Yeah. Um, it, it should be less common than it is. You'd wish it is. But it's definitely not that unheard of. Um, huge issue. One of probably one of the most common things I'd even see if I assess something dealing with JWT is just not caring about whether or not it's signed. And of course, if it's not signed, you can modify and do whatever the heck you want with it. Yeah. Um, and the reasoning for it, like you said, there was no length check on the signature check. It just did a straight up compare. So when you're comparing zero bytes, it's always going to succeed. And we've seen this exact type of issue before. I can't remember exactly what we were covering, but this code pattern is, it, it seems to be like a really common code pattern, which is really silly. Um, but it's, it's just one of those things that people seem to overlook. Um, so how they ended up discovering the exact details and root causing the issue was uh, after some recon, they discovered they were using the service stack library um, which is, you know, open source, and they were able to look into the source code and, and find that issue. Now, like I was saying earlier, this issue was already fixed by Service Stack in August. Um, and they found that this was weird because the customer that they were assessing seemed to be very vigilant when it came to third-party libraries and keeping them patched. Um, and uh, yeah, they said no other dependency had known vulnerabilities, and it seemed they paid attention to security advisories. Uh, the problem here seemed to be there was no advisory or impact given for this issue. It was just kind of silently fixed by Service Stack. So that was the reason they put out this blog post. Even though the issue was already fixed, it, it wasn't like a, a zero day they discovered or anything. Um, they wanted to get an advisor created and a CVE assigned. That way others also have that advisory to go off of so that uh, more companies don't end up getting blindsided by this, basically. Um, which I think was a cool move on their part. Uh, they, they didn't have to do that. Obviously, it is good PR, uh, but still, like, they weren't obligated to do that. So I think that's uh, that's good on this this pen testing company. But yeah, really unfortunate that these silly no-length checks are as prevalent as they are. Um, if, if you're comparing something, make sure to actually check that there's something to compare against, or else uh, you're, you're going to open yourself up to issues. Yeah, so, I mean, I do want to kind of call out here that uh, Service Stack definitely downplayed this issue. Um, I just pulled up the release notes. 
okay. and I believe I'm trying to find exactly where they were talking about it. Uh, yeah, so if you're using JWT auth, please upgrade to V592 when possible to resolve a JWT signature verification issue. That's the only warning that they gave about this, which I would argue this sort of issue does kind of warrant a more significant warning when it's literally a complete authentication bypass. Yeah, I'd agree that that's definitely downplaying. Oh, um, and I this happened that. to be, well, this was why their client hadn't updated is because the patch notes didn't really indicate that they, that it was a huge issue. Um, so I do just want to call that out from service stack. Like that's, you should be clear about your vulnerabilities. Yeah, especially when you're being used as a third party library and, and things, right? Like that's, that's part of your, I guess, duty to people who are using your stuff. So yeah, that, yeah. That, I think that's fair to call them out on that. Um, up next is the vulnerability in the Brave Browser's Tor implementation. Now, I didn't know this, but apparently in 2018, Brave integrated Tor sessions into Incognito, which is kind of cool. And I'm surprised I never heard about that, but I've just never really been a somebody that's really ingrained into Brave or anything like that. Um, but the issue comes down to the fact that Brave has a referral rewards program. So they commonly use this for crypto sponsored backgrounds and referral links to crypto trading websites. So among some of their partners, I think are Coinbase, uh, Softonic, and MarketWatch. Uh, that were some of the examples that they listed that were part of that program. So you can see uh, in the code snippet that they provide there, um, they have an XBrave partner header in the uh, in the referral header. So And this header is sent even if you're browsing with Tor, by the way. On top of that, there's also a local data, uh, data store for this referral program, which includes sensitive information about Tor browsing sessions. And this data doesn't get wiped after the session is terminated. So some of the data that's included in that local, local store is the uh, referral attempt account, uh, timestamp, and whether or not Tor was used when browsing it. So pretty like compromising information if someone can get a hold of that private data store. Um, now that issue was fixed. I believe the local store is actually clear now. Although it, yeah, it, it wasn't like super it was. clear if they still send that header or not. I, I was trying to see if they also don't send that anymore, but I they didn't so, really talk about that. So it seems like that header shouldn't have been sent when in incognito mode at all. So I don't believe they'd still be sending it. Okay. Um I'm not sure if they specifically call that out, but that seemed to be the gist that you got when looking at the emails that they are the messages they had back and forth as for the information that actually gets linked to me it does require kind of local access to be able to pull that folder because so it's when it's sent out to brave um it's bucketed into like did they use it in the last 24 hours or last week or 28 days or ever uh, like it's just kind of bucketed into that it doesn't give a lot of information but as they do point out if you were um, if you were, say, a civil rights activist using Tor for something and got raided by the police, you know, they'd be able to access that timestamp. They could correlate that with timestamps from, like, your ISP to be able to do, know that, okay, you were using Tor at exactly this time, like, to the millisecond. Uh, so, like, definitely some issues with that, but it does require that local access for that particular part of the leak um obviously the header isn't uh isn't that same issue like these are multiple issues here but for that one it did require local local access yeah even though it requires a high degree of access um it is basically in tor's threat model so oh for sure uh... yeah no and that was um they mentioned that that wasn't something they intended to do their intent of and what, how they fixed that was they logged incognito usage. Uh, what they ended up doing was logging every incognito usage, which includes Tor. But what they only wanted to do was like the non-Tor one. So what they ended up doing was only logging it for non-Tor. And they ended up deleting things afterwards, too. Yeah. So the authors do give credit to Brave for being clear with communication and being open to the issues, uh, as well as having a quick turnaround. So that's cool to see. Um, it was fixed within a few days. I, I will say, I don't know how I feel about that, um, that referral rewards program in Brave, because it, it sounds like it's not like a opt 
in, it sounds like it's an opt out. Like as soon as you install Brave and use it, this is already happening in the background, which I mean, eh, I don't know how I feel about that. I feel like that is kind of, um, I don't know, stealthy, I guess. I don't know what your thoughts are on that, Z. Like, do you think that's fair that they do that? I, I was thinking about it a little bit. It is a small set of specific Brave Partner websites that it's basically announcing, hey, this person uses Brave. It does feel a little bit antithetical to Brave themselves. Like, they're kind of yeah. like anti-tracking itself. So it does feel a little bit weird. It is a way that they're making some money. It is just a limited number of sites. Although I do see like Soft Tonic, and I am not a fan of Soft Tonic. Uh, I feel I like mean, I haven't even heard of Soft Tonic in years. Yeah, like, well, that's the same thing. <laughs> like I, I actually, I'm just opening it up in another window to make sure it's the website I think it is, because it's been so long. That they just have like such a bad reputation, though. Yeah, I I've seen some software that's used them, and I'm like, oh no, <laughs> they're a mirror that I can use somewhere else. <laughs> Pretty much, um, I I would say that Brave kind of this does feel a little bit shady from them. I can kind of understand it. It's definitely a limited impact. It's announcing you're using Brave to a small set of website, but it still feels pretty shady. Especially since the only reason to do that is effectively for tracking purposes. Like, I exactly. can't imagine any other reason why they would want that. Uh, like, I, I can't come up with, like, a charitable explanation. Maybe Brave will put out a statement about it. But, I don't know. It, it does feel off. And actually, looking at this picture here, there are quite a few domains. Uh, that yeah, I think like uh, Coinbase and stuff were just the headlining ones. It, it seems like there were, was like a more extensive list. So, yeah. Yeah, I, I found that to be a little bit shady, but we'll give them credit where credit is due. At least they did fix this issue and uh, they were they were quick to, to address it. So, yeah, it was fixed within a few days. I think the author even said if it wasn't reported uh, before a weekend, they, they think it probably would have been fixed the same day. So that's cool. Yeah, I mean, it It was a good response. I have mixed feelings about Brave in general. I do use Brave. Um, it's my mobile browser. So, was it Brave that introduced that, uh, that token system? Yes, the attention token. Oh, yeah. That's what they... They took a lot of heat for it because Tom Scott didn't seem to understand that his picture was the fav icon for his website. So he made a big deal about them creating this spoofing page asking for donations. Um, and using his picture when it was using the fav icon of his website as like the picture it showed. Um, he took a lot of hate over that. Uh, but yeah, Brave was browser and they def Brave definitely did some things wrong with that too. I'm not, not shifting all the blame, but it was really just because one e celebrity got worked up over it. Yeah. Uh, that said, I think we can move on to a post from IOActive, which talks about a privilege escalation in Windows through the Microsoft Store. So this focuses on the ability to facilitate moddable games. So for those who haven't played many awesome video games that support modding, uh, some PC games allow you to use like mod tools or what have you to add custom functionality to a game, um, adding to its extendability. So uh, an example that probably almost everyone has heard of is Minecraft, right? There's there's the Minecraft plugin system, for example. Um, now, because Windows apps are usually put into read-only restricted directories, mod moddable games need an exception uh, to allow the installation files to be modified for installing mods. To do that, they create a directory specifically for that purpose called modifiable Windows apps. Uh, now, because of that powerful capability, Microsoft does limit the ability to have your game as a moddable game to a whitelisted set of games that are pre-approved by Microsoft. Um, so the researchers at IOActive chose to target a game that supported this uh, capability, uh, going with one called Faster Than Light, which is some space strategy game. Um, they initially attempted to use junctions in the installer directory to be able to install games to an arbitrary directory. 
That initially didn't work though, because um, users don't have the permission to replace the modifiable Windows apps directory and access to the sub contents is restricted. They discovered though, that Windows provides a feature that allows you to specify where new apps and documents save to by default through the control panel, presumably so that people can install games and stuff to a different drive other than the C drive which makes sense from a convenience uh, point of view. Yeah, and this is the same thing that uh, you use for like your library. So like when you click documents or videos, you can point that to any folder. Uh, when it comes to this, like it's just asking for your drive in this case, but it's it's the same feature. You can tell it where it should store certain things. Yeah. The problem was when they found that they changed to a different drive other than the C drive, um, those permissions were much less restricted for some reason, and users managed to gain access to the modifiable Windows apps directory. So then they could go back to that original attack they tried to pull off, which was uh, turning the game directory into a junction to make the installer operate on an arb arbitrary directory. So initially, uh, they used that to basically facilitate an arbitrary directory wipe primitive. Uh, they would cause the installation to fail, and which would cause the game files to get wiped. And they use the uh, two junctions so that when the game data is deleted, it wipes the directory you set the junctions to point to. Uh, they then use the installation feature uh, with the same trick to get arbitrary file right. And that's how the uh, escalation of privilege comes into play. Uh, at the bottom of the post, they have a POC uh, for how they did that. I think they have a, yeah, they have like a little GIF showing uh, what they did. Um, I, I thought this was an interesting vector. I haven't really heard of um, Microsoft Store being targeted in this way before, so I, I think that was kind of interesting and in where this blog post brings some unique insights to the table. Um, at the same time, though, this is yet another junction or symlink-based attack. Uh, it seems so like these one, are just never going away. This one differs a little bit, though, because this isn't the RPC control vector from James Forshaw. This is actually just making a directory junction. Um, and as out of chat, my friend mentions uh, or asks, junctions can be created without high privs. Um, my understanding was that no, you couldn't do these junctions without having the privileges for it. That that RPC control was kind of the trick to get away with it. But it looks like IOActive here is just straight up using the junctions now i could i might be mistaken here like i said they're definitely presenting this as though uh creating the junction is something you can do from just the standard user account uh that's definitely the presentation of this article so i'm kind of going to roll with that but i do have the same question uh my fry um i did i thought that this was some that did require higher privileges and it's something i'll have to look into a little bit further Unless you know offhand, Spectre. No, I don't. Uh, I will quickly pull out a chat, though. Uh, somebody asked uh, Junction, what is a Junction? Um, for those listening who aren't familiar with Windows terminology, because Microsoft does just like to rename things for no reason, uh, a Junction is basically a symlink. Um, it's it's the Windows equivalent of a symlink. They are a little bit different, and I think there are like different types of Junctions. It gets really unnecessarily convoluted as is uh microsoft's way but for all intents and purposes it is basically a symlink so for those familiar with linux and not familiar with windows that might help you uh, understand the issue a little bit more here um but yeah this this is just another example of how the symlinks and junctions can be leveraged to do some damage and um yeah, and yeah, I, will I, I say, never really thought of I, it being used in this context, though. I, I really liked this, uh, the double junction for getting the delete to happen uh, by using a pivot junction so that it'll see uh, the sensitive folder kind of like underneath something that you control or something that you pointed to. I did like that sort of double junction attack. Um, I haven't really seen that before. Uh, kind of makes an intuitive sense when you think about how the attack's working and everything, but... Yeah, I don't know. I, um, like I say, I, I do have the questions about the privileges, but I, that was kind of like a different perspective or a different take on it, I guess. Yeah, uh, I think uh, that double junction trick is one of those things where it's it's not necessarily new, but it's new. It, it was new to me, and I'm guessing new to you as well, uh, based on the way you were speaking of it. So, yeah, some some interesting uh, insights out of this post. Although one thing that is 
maybe I just didn't read it, but they managed to spawn a anti-authority slash system shell using this. But they only talk about basically just replacing files, like deleting files and modifying, like having it right somewhere else. But they end off with the elevation time section and they don't really talk about how they weaponize this. Yeah, I'm guessing it was a DLL hijack, but yeah, it would have been nice Fair, to have yeah, more of the details on that. I guess that kind of comes down, I guess they don't maybe explain exactly how um, how it gets the files that it's going over, like what control you have over what it's over, right? Because yeah, I guess if you could just include a new installation file, it's a DLL pointed to right into like System32 or something, then yeah, you could easily elevate but yeah, I, I just feel like they probably could have included a few details to make that a bit more clear. That does seem like there should be the obvious attack vector, especially since you mentioned um, doing a deal all over. I, like, that's a pretty obvious vector. Uh, it just feels like they probably could have included some details to that. Yeah, I feel like that is the most likely like the strategy that you laid out there, just because um, if that was their strategy, I could see why they might not want to include that in the post. They might see that as something that is obvious, uh, or at least obvious to them. So they just didn't want to add what they would see as filler to the post. Um, that said, I, I agree. I think they probably should have included at least like a maybe a sentence or two just mentioning how they bridge that gap. Um, but yeah, se seems most likely it's a DLL hijack. Uh, visiting a favorite set of topics, kernel and fuzzing. We have a topic that touches on fuzzing the extended Berkeley packet filter in Linux kernel. So the bug in this blog post, uh, it initially talks about CDE 2020 8835, which was an out of bounds access and PPF verifier. We actually talked about this bug in episode 38 of the podcast, which you can check out if you're uh, interested in hearing about how that bug works. Um, all of our podcasts have timestamps, so you can just uh, check out that bot on YouTube and, and go to that section if you want to hear about it. Essentially, um, the commit that tried to address that bug ended up introducing a new one, and it was discovered by fuzzing. So while that bug uh, will be interesting to look at, first the author goes into methodology around the architecture of the fuzzer they wrote, yeah, so uh, as well as some custom bug detection. Just before you go into that, um, I do want to talk a little bit about eBPF out of chat. It's, you know, how does this relate to JIT? Uh, if you're not familiar with Berkeley Packed Filter programs, effectively you're able to write small, very constrained programs that will uh, be compiled and executed in the kernel. Um, has kind of its own little instructions there that, um, and also has constraints on those instructions and what they can do to make sure it's going to terminate, uh, things like that. But effectively it is like a little bit of a program that gets just in time compiled and executed in the kernel to run against uh, network packets coming in. Um, so that's kind of where the JIT aspect comes in. It is a little bit weird to have a JIT in the kernel, and BPF has definitely been an area where there have been vulnerabilities before. Yeah, it, it's basically a VM in the kernel, which is not a great idea. Yeah, uh, VM is also... a better way to describe it than what I did. Yeah, it's why in some operating systems like FreeBSD, uh, BPF is privileged to, to root. Uh, for whatever reason, in Linux, it's not. Because <laughs> um, the ability to run custom instructions in a kernel parser, it just opens up so many potential bugs because you're dealing with pointer arithmetic, and that gets really tricky to manage when you allow people, uh, untrusted people, to specify what kind of arithmetic you're doing there. And like you said, like there's been probably... I want to say around like 10 bugs in BPF if I want to be generous. So I don't have an exact count, but there's been a lot of issues that have spawned over uh, out of BPF. Um, but yeah, like I was saying, they, they get into the fuzzer at first. Um, along with some of the background, they include some background on the difficulties involved with fuzzing BPF specifically and why they didn't use existing kernel fuzzers like uh, syscaller. Uh, so the, the two points they mention is that kernel can be slow when you're dealing with syscalls and context switches. And the second point is uh, BPF verifiers are protected by a mutex, which makes fuzzing multiple cores difficult because you end up waiting on that mutex or deadlocking with it. Um, and they cite that that would, be, that would scale badly with cores. So 
The strategy they went with was basically calling kernel functions in user space programs, which is not super new. Uh, we've talked about a strategy that's used this before, taking kernel drivers and executing them in user space and then hooking the uh, kernel API functions like kmalloc, for example, and just substituting it with the user land malloc. Um, in terms of architecture of how the fuzzer works, it's actually very similar to syscaller. Uh, it has a manager and worker VMs that work under it and report back up to it. Uh, what I thought was unique and interesting, though, was the bug detection part, um, because they cited the fact that if corruption didn't trigger a crash, it probably wouldn't get detected. Um, and basically, what they did here was they did a bit of a taint check. Uh, they wrote a random value into a mapping where a write should have occurred, and then checked if the BPF filter overwrote that value. Um, and then use that as an oracle to determine if the pointer arithmetic checked out or if it didn't. Uh, if that value was overwritten, the pointer arithmetic was fine. If it wasn't overwritten, then there was corruption there. Um, so from there, they basically did generation-based fuzzing with templates. Getting into the bug, which is CVE 2020-27194, um, the bug I mentioned earlier that was fixed earlier this year was essentially an issue uh, which was falsely deriving a 32-bit value from a 64-bit register when performing range tracking. I'm not going to go too much into the details of that bug because, like I said, we did cover it before. Um, but how they attempted to fix this issue was they just extended the range tracking by pulling out 32-bit variants into their own functions and fields uh, in the verifier structure to handle them separately. So before they tried to handle both 64-bit and 32-bit values in the same paths, now they, they try to separate that out to handle them separately. So how they did that was uh, they wrote new functions to handle the 32-bit variants. And they it seems they basically just copy and pasted the original ones and changed the pasted ones for 32-bit. Problem is, one of the functions broke that pattern. And the 32-bit variant actually wrote the 64-bit values into 32-bit fields, which you can see why that would be an issue when it comes to overflows and truncations and whatnot. Um, and this was the scalar 32 min max or function. So yeah, like I said, it seems they just copy and pasted the original functions. And this bug was a result of a copy paste error. They just forgot to change uh, the, the width of those fields in that function. So the fix for this was very straightforward. They just fixed it so the function uses 32 bit values instead of 64 bit values. Um, I like this blog post and I thought the bug was pretty funny. Uh, it's always fun to see those copy paste uh, derived errors. You'd think after the first bug, they'd go through and try to test for these kinds of issues because those copy-paste errors are so easy to make, but obviously they didn't. Um, I do also have a so few easy questions, to though. overlook. Yeah. Um, I do have a few questions or points of contention with the uh, blog post, though. Uh, for one thing, so when they were citing the background of why they chose to write their own fuzzer instead of using existing ones, uh, they said that BPF verifiers are protected by a mutex and thus aren't scalable. I mean, you can still scale. You would just run multiple VMs that are hitting the verifier in parallel um, and then just isolate each core to a VM, which is exactly what he did. Um, you can do that with syscaller, so I'm not really sure on that point of like being a valid point of why not to use syscaller well but syscaller you're generally going to want to run multiple programs at the same time too which you wouldn't be able to do with the mutex holding it you would want to do that well, but you can configure it not to and which is would essentially do the same thing he did with more effort <laughs> so I, um, that's why i'm trying to think of why they wouldn't just configure syscaller yeah, one question from my friend. Does syscaller fuzz this part of the kernel? I don't think there are any descriptions right now that'll hit BPF, but you should be able to... Uh, I don't know, what would you want to do? You'd want to add... Because this wouldn't be just straight-up descriptions to fuzz this. You'd probably have to you wrap need it... You need syscalls. Yeah, you'd probably need the pseudo syscalls to actually do it, but you could get some coverage in here i'm not sure if syscaller would really be the right option for fuzzing bpf kafl probably would have been a better option yeah the yeah because i mean syscaller is obviously really folks around the syscalls so the other thing that i wanted to touch on was the custom bug detection solution so like i said i thought it was neat and a clever solution 
I'm also not entirely sure all that effort was necessary, though, because with Linux kernel, you have the source code, and he's running this in, like, he's compiling it and running it in user land. Um, they should have been able to compile this with a SAN instrumentation, which should have been able to catch the issues that they were trying to solve. So I'm I'm not sure why they didn't just compile it with a SAN. There might have maybe there's some challenges there that they tried to do that and they just didn't list that in the blog post, which if that's the case, fair enough. Um, but that's just something that ran through my mind while I was reading it is why not just use the existing instrumentation that already exists, right? Um that, that instrumentation is provided by the compiler for you. It's it doesn't really require a lot of extra effort to use. So it does Although... seem weird that they didn't leverage that. I'm not sure how a sound would work if you're like doing the usual hooking on like kalloc and stuff. Um, I'm not sure if just the difference in how the allocators work would also cause problems with a sound. Um, uh, like th that is be. a possibility. They don't discuss it at all, so we're only left to speculate. Yeah, I wish they kind of went into the insights on that, because I feel like that would have been a, like an obvious path to take. So there probably was challenges they hit that they just didn't lay out. But, but also, uh, like, performance would be another case. Uh, they do have a fairly simple bug detection here, like a very quick check. They don't need to instrument everything and, like, go through all of that. So I can kind of see that being another case. They're getting more iterations out of it. Yeah. Um, the the final point of contention I had was I'm not super sold on the fuzzing kernel code is too slow angle. Uh, they mentioned the syscalls and context switches and stuff like that and how that would slow down fuzzing. For sure, context switches do have a cost, but is the performance benefit really worth all that effort of like implementing in user land, uh, having to hook all those kernel API functions, and then also potentially losing instrumentation? Like we just talked about. So According the hooking, to the author, though, it is. You do the hooking once, and then you should be able to reuse those hooks on other applications too, like on other code being pulled out of the kernel. So this kind of comes down to the value of uh, what we kind of talked about before is micro fuzzing. You know, when you mm -hmm. pull out specific functions to do. Um, I'm going to say, like, if assuming you have. Like just you've written out your central library to hook those kernel functions and you're able to easily do this like it actually it speeds things up quite a bit to not need to hit the kernel at all like you're definitely getting more iterations and you can definitely debate whether or not more iterations is actually the the right metric to focus on but you can't deny that more iterations more tests in theory the ability to get more coverage quicker I'd have to say that it probably is worth it to pull some things out of the kernel and fuzz them in user land if you're able to get significant speed ups. Um, but you do kind of need these systems that are fairly isolated, um, that just kind of stand on their own. Yeah, I mean, I was going to say that is the problem with this type of approach is it's not really scalable. If you're using uh, a driver or if you're looking to target a driver that uses a lot of kernel API functions, like, think about it, like some of these drivers, you could potentially have to hook like hundreds of functions. And at that point, it just doesn't seem like it's worth the, the benefit. Um, but if you've written a library that just hooks the entire kernel effectively, I mean, that would take quite a bit of time and everything. It'd be a lot of work. But you do that once and it works for everything now. Um, pulling out a chat, why wouldn't it be scalable? I, why I'm saying it wouldn't be scalable is the amount of manual overhead involved in hooking all those functions increases like a lot when you're looking at different subsystems of the yeah kernel. and you're talking about kind of like the human scalability aspect of it not it wouldn't be scalable in terms of execution time like executing across multiple cores yeah exactly the the human aspect um now what i would have wished this post included was he cited this performance angle and why they wanted to fuzz the user land i wish there were stats to back that up because uh, I feel like there could be a perceived bias there, right? Like if you're running it in user land and you're like, oh, this seems to be faster. But especially when you're talking about kernel, there's so many things that could be impacting performance that one, like there's a lot of variance that could be introduced. Like it could run even faster. Uh, there could have just been something running at the same time as your thing was running when you measured. 
So that's why I wish there was more stats that we could look at to kind of get some insights there. But obviously, I think they didn't one, feel the need to include that. So that's that's fair, I guess. I think one stat is just to look at the fact that user line programs are have significantly more iterations than like syscall or get syscalls. I think that would be kind of one of the obvious cases. Now, technically, you can definitely argue that that's a bit of an apples to oranges comparison. Like they're just not the same thing. You're, you know, in this case, you're still pulling out kernel code, but like there is at least uh, what seems to be an intuitive understanding that user land programs are faster. Mm -hmm. I will wrap up this blog post by saying I did really like it. Uh, I think this there's a lot of useful insights here, especially on the fuzzing side of things. Yeah, um, I enjoyed the read about like his process for the fuzzer. I thought that was yeah. interesting. And it's uh, another example of a bug that was fixed, but wasn't fixed properly. You know, another one of those, you know, adages that just because they tried to fix something or they issued a patch doesn't mean that it was patched correctly. And this fuzzer and this blog post uh, demonstrates that. Uh, and another point in the favor of BPF is just really damn hard to properly verify and secure. Um, there's so many edge cases that it's hard to really keep them all in your mind when you're writing the code uh, for BPF and the types of operations it supports, which is just another example of why I'm not really sure why it's exposed to unprivileged, unprivileged users or why it's even in the kernel at all. But that, that's a different debate maybe for a different time. Um, but with that said, I think we can move into our research, which is our last topic of the episode. So capture the bot. So this is using adversarial examples to improve CAPTCHA robustness to bot attacks. So this is a little bit different today for our research section. Uh, it's not something that's fuzzing or vulnerability research or exploit dev related. This one is about improving CAPTCHAs to be easy for humans to solve, but robust against bots. This year especially, we're seeing the need arise for such advancements. Uh, the automated scalping that's happened with uh, major, major PC part launches this year, uh, NVIDIA. Uh, has been kind of off the charts. Um, and something this paper points out is that's only going to get worse if things stay as they are. So deep learning is advancing. Uh, they note it's even surpassed humans when it comes to some tasks like image and speech recognition, which are the most common things that are used for captures, right? The ability to parse an image and, uh, you know, put the characters or whatever that it's displaying. So their paper introduces a new technique called capture, which stands for capture technique uniquely resistant. I'm not sure why they needed the uniquely in there. It seems like something they just needed a filler word to be able to spell out a, a real word, but whatever. Um, the basis of it, though, seems to be the idea of using adversarial perturbations to throw off machine learning. So adding frequency uh, domain perturbations into the CAPTCHA that are mostly invisible to humans or humans aren't really going to care about, but it's going to mess with the classifiers of bots. So how they generate these adversarial images is by combining two techniques. They use evolutionary algorithms, which is basically a technical implementation of natural selection. Um, and they use that to generate samples that fool deep neural networks into thinking that they recognize an image with 99% uh, certainty, um, that they could recognize the image and make sense of it when really the image is basically just garbage. And they take that image and they encode it into the image that they show for the CAPTCHA. The second technique that they use is leveraging adversarial patches, which is a common technique of fooling classifiers, especially earlier on, early on in the year when we covered a lot of uh, deep learning based papers. Um, adversarial patches were probably the most common technique that we saw and covered on, uh, on the podcast. So the idea of adversarial patches is you, you just overlay a patch over the image and the classifier uses the information from that patch where it should be discarding it. It treats it as more important than it actually is um, and that can throw off the classifier. So they combine these two techniques to, um, to derive their main product, which is the capture, um, the capture idea. So on page 11, uh, I think it's figure three. I'm just going to scroll down to it. You can kind of see the results of their research. 
So you can see the images, they have those patches, the little circles that are overlaying it. Um, when a human sees that, they're just going to disregard it. They're not going to pay any attention to it. Um, and you can see there's some distortions in some of the images as well. Um, and they state when they looked at the evaluation, uh, they did a survey of 113 people with these types of captures and asked them to solve 10 capture challenges. And overall, um, humans solved it with an 85% success rate. And it had a 92% success rate against bots. Um, and they stated that humans, the people who took the survey, so found just this to be capture clear, useful. that's 92%. Like bots failed at 92% of the time. Yeah, <laughs> just 92% they, success bots rate. Bots didn't sounds succeed like, 92% of the time. Yeah, sounds like bots <laughs> were doing better than the humans were. Yeah. Um, but one thing that was interesting that I wanted to call out is the human participants on the survey said they liked this CAPTCHA more than some of the existing ones because some of the images were just so different from what the CAPTCHA was asking for that they could immediately disregard them. So they were able to solve them a little bit faster. Um, so that was kind of an interesting point to, uh, to call out. Um, another thing I found interesting in their evaluation section the unrecognizable images encoding on their own seem to have a higher success rate than uh, both techniques combined against the bots. Um, this was in their usability evaluation. I'll bring it up here now. Um, so you can see the success rate. Unrecognizable images, they had 96.5. And then adversarial patch, they had 86. And then combined it, combined to 92. So just using the encoding with the unrecognizable images would have been better against bots. I'm assuming the reason they combined it with the adversarial patch was, I guess, because it maybe they could tone down the unrecognizable images to make it easier for humans to solve. They didn't really seem to talk about this aspect for some reason. I, I really wish they did, because that discrepancy seemed like something that would have been worth addressing, uh, in my opinion. But yeah, I mean, that was just... Uh, that was a weird quirk that I noticed in their evaluation section. Overall, though, I think it's a it's a cool technique. Uh, it's using some of the stuff that we've covered on the podcast before and some of the research we've seen in academia and putting it to a good use uh, that we could really use going forward because uh, the, the bot situation with scalping is not going to get any better, uh, as we've seen. Yeah, now, I see, like this paper... Um... I think you're just about to transition to pretty much uh, because of my history. Um, yeah, I kind of got my star with a lot of programming actually in doing capture breaking. Now, this was back like 2003, 2004, where um, it captures were a lot simpler. It was more of an OCR problem, just recognizing characters. But I also spent a lot of time with my first kind of development job. Part of what I did was trying to catch bots. And some of that was creating uh, traps for bots. So I kind of like this because it harkens back to that sort of anti-cheat style. Um, so I was working on a game at the time and uh, doing some anti-cheat uh, development. But a lot of what I did was trying to find these little quirks and how the bots would work in order to detect the humans and people are humans and bots apart. Uh, so this, I don't know. I, I like this paper just because it harkens back to that approach rather than just making it harder and harder to read, finding other things that just trip the bots up because it's either unexpected. They're not trained against it and things like that. Uh, so I just want to kind of give a shout to that area. Cause I don't think that gets enough research and that's where you start getting easier captures to solve that tend to have, a, that are also easier for humans, harder for bots to deal with. This is one of the very few practical applications I've seen of the adversarial uh, deep neural network attacks that we've covered. Because we, we used to cover uh, a lot of these types of adversarial uh, poisoning based attacks. And while they were cool, they were kind of contrived and they didn't really seem like they could practically be applied anywhere. Like they were like they were fooling like classifiers for like security cameras and stuff like that. But it was very obvious that there was like somebody would have to wear like an LED strip or something like very uh, obvious to well, somebody who would actually be in the room, for example. It didn't really, really seem like there were practical applications. The real practical one to me I, I'm reminded of is 
there was one where you had kind of like the person tracking as they would walk by. So you would have to set up a TV to play a partic particular image so that when you walked by it, the tracking would think that uh, you were still on the TV or whatever. Like it would end up tracking that image and like you walk away. It's like, yep, you've got a carry in a TV. Nobody's going to notice this. Position it just right against the camera and all of that. Um, yeah, I don't know. That's when you talk about the impracticality of some of them. That's the one that comes to mind, though. Yeah, but this one is a very practical application and a very um, a, a good case for it to be used. Like it's very justifiable. It's not shoved in uh, forcefully, which is something that we sometimes see with academia, unfortunately. But in this case, like it's very suited to the job, and it seems to have a high success rate. And even uh, could solve that problem of captchas just being stupid hard, like you were saying earlier. Uh, when when I have to solve like Google reCAPTCHA, depending on the setting that the site has set on the captcha, sometimes it's just brutal, and I don't even bother. I just leave and go somewhere else for whatever I wanted because it, it makes you go through like three rounds of of stupid captchas. Where I think this could fill that gap of being both easy for humans to solve and um, combating the advances being made in, in defeating CAPTCHAs. So, yeah, really cool paper. Um, and like you said, cool that it could harken back to some of your some of your early days, right? Um, so that's pretty much all of our topics. We're going to wrap it up there. Uh, thank you to everyone who tuned in. You can catch the VODs on Twitch or on YouTube at 6 p.m. Eastern, 3 p.m. Pacific on Tuesday after the stream. Uh, we also have previous podcasts up on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and more links on Anchor. If you want to join the community, go ahead and join our Discord. You can find the link in uh, the Twitch or in the description of the video if you're watching it on YouTube or whatever. Uh, keep a lookout for our discussion video, which is dropping this Thursday. And we will be back again next Monday at the same time, 3 p.m. Eastern, 12 p.m. Pacific. And we will see you all then.